Um, so please don't include any confidential patient health information during the session. Um, so on screen is information on how to get on uh, audio using your telephone. Uh, if you don't have that capability with your computer, uh, mic and speakers, you're uh, more than welcome to use the phone line. If you are doing that, please go ahead and mute your computer speakers, however, or we will get uh, that feedback loop. Um, please don't place us on hold or we will hear that music. Uh, star six will mute and unmute you and I can mute you if absolutely necessary. Uh, please enable your cameras. We'd love to see you. Um, I will practice what we preach right now. There we go. Uh, Grace is on now. Um, so click start my webcam after you preview uh, the camera. And here's our disclosure and accreditation statements. We have nothing to disclose today. Case consultation reimbursements is really for our other sessions, our other clinics. Uh, if you're interested in that with um, Molina Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield, bring your cases to us. Uh, so get in touch with uh, Michelle Widener is the person to talk to about that, or you can always contact me as well. And so uh, this is your opportunity for roll call. If you're able to speak and you unmute with star six, let us know that you're out there and where you're from. Who do we have on the line? This is Mary Louise Cootie. I'm here with New Mexico grads. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. It's like we had a hold music there for just a second with somebody. <laughs> that. This is Amanda okay. Frost with Hidalgo Medical Services in Lordsburg. Hey, Amanda. And I can see quite a few people are chatting in as well, so that also works. Um, so at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to McCain Sharp uh, for introductions. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, and as um, Kevin said, um, if you haven't had a chance to say hello on the phone, feel free to enter in the chat box so that we know you're here. Um, this is the first of a series of six webinars that we will be doing um, as part of a, the, our Grads Plus funding um, in collaboration with uh, the New Mexico Alliance for School-Based Health Care. Um, so we'll start today and then um, have one monthly um, through April and really want to kind of address the issues for our um, expectant and parenting teen population here in New Mexico. Um, so we're starting today with a presentation by uh, Grace Bulak, who is an uh, attorney at Pegasus Legal Services, and she's going to be talking about um, healthcare. Uh, rights um, with a focus on the expected and parenting teen population. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, please feel to, free to enter them in the chat box. Um, and we will be sending out information soon about the, uh, the next upcoming webinars and what the topics will be. So thank you for joining us. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Grace Spulock, like McCain said, and I am an attorney with Pegasus Legal Services for Children here in Albuquerque. And um, I do a lot of work with young people who are not living with a parent or guardian. And um, historically, I've done a lot of work with young parents representing them in custody child support cases. So I'm really going to um, talk about two issues today. First of all is going to be um, consent and confidentiality rights um, for young people in general, so people who are under 18. And then um, the second piece of it is going to look specifically at the rights of young parents um, with an emphasis on their rights um, if they're under 18, um, but I think a lot of young parents face stigma and barriers uh, even when they're in that kind of 18 to 21 group. Um, so just keeping that in mind also. Yeah. And so as I'm going through this material, there's a lot of material to cover here in an hour. Um, so I'm going to move quickly through the consent and confidentiality stuff. 
So if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, I know it can be difficult sometimes with this format, but if you do have questions, um, feel free to chime in on the phone or type them in the chat box, and I will try my best to answer them as we go along. Okay, so to kind of start out, I want us to think about these questions that you see and the challenges that you see, because I'm sure that you all have a lot of experience with young parents and see issues that come up over and over um, with the young people you work with. Um, so first of all, what common questions do you see from or hear from young people who are, are parents regarding their rights to have custody of their children. And then what challenges um, do, have you seen in ensuring that young parents can get confidential care for themselves and their children? And so I'd like for you to start out by sharing some of your thoughts and experiences with me because um, I know that there are a lot of questions and a lot of challenges with young parents. And so I want to make sure that I'm addressing some of the things that you've seen and some of the questions that you have. Does anyone have anything they want to share? And if not, that's fine. And if you think of things as I'm going through the material, go ahead and just, like I said, um, chime in and let me know. OK, so like I said, I'm covering two things here. The first is going to be consent and confidentiality as it applies to all minors. And then um, looking at the specific rights of young parents around custody, paternity, and child support. Um, and really thinking about the stressors that young parents face, um, very often getting medical care and accessing medical care is not something that either is seems doable to them or it's not their first priority because of all the other challenges that they're facing. And so Young parents face a number of challenges around continuing their education, managing family dynamics and expectations in their own families and with the other parent of their child, and then meeting basic needs for themselves and for their children. And these stressors can really exacerbate conflicts between parents. Um, they can exacerbate other situations, such as um, you know, dealing with finding stable housing, and also accessing health care. So really um, thinking about these things as they go through this material, even if young parents have a right to consent to certain types of health care, it can be very difficult for them to actually get to that provider to access that care. Um, I see a lot of young parents who don't have transportation, who don't have child care for their child to get them, you know, to go to the doctor themselves. And so thinking about these things as well is really important when we're working with young parents. Okay. And so in New Mexico, there are really three main areas where young people have the right to consent to health care if they are under 18. And that's with reproductive health care, mental health care, and uh, medically necessary care for young people who are either not living with a parent or guardian or who are parents. And so I'll talk about each of these three areas in detail um, as I go through them. And this applies to really to all young people regardless of whether or not they are parents. Um, and then I will emphasize some of the specific ways that young parents really need to really need assistance in accessing care for themselves and for their children. And so a young person, the other thing that I really want to stress is that a young person who is a parent, no matter what their age is, has the right to consent to all health care for their child. So if a young person is 14 and they have 
a child, they have the right to consent to all of the care for that child. And they also um, have the right to consent to all of their own medically necessary health care. And so I think that's confusing for a lot of young people. There's a lot of misinformation. They're told that, you know, if you're 14 and you have a child, actually your parents, so the child's, the infant's grandparents are the ones who have the right to consent to treatment. Or if you go to the doctor, you're going to be reported for being too young to have a child. And so there's a lot of bad information out there among young people um, regarding what they can and can't do for their children. So just to stress again that young people, no matter what their age are, if they are the parent of a child, they are the ones who have the rights to make decisions for that child, including consenting to that child's health care. Okay. And so we're going to talk about consent and confidentiality, which are really two sides of the same coin. Um, consent looks at um, whether or not a person can say yes or no to a certain treatment. And confidentiality um, is about the right to control access to healthcare information. And so there's several laws affecting a minor's right to confidentiality. There's HIPAA, which is the federal law. Um, about confidentiality. There's state laws, and then when you're looking at educational settings, you have to look at FERPA as well, which is a federal law regarding education records. And so under HIPAA, under the federal law, a parent typically has access to their child's medical records. And there are some exceptions to that. And the first one is if a minor has the right to consent to the health care under the state law and the parent's consent is not required. So HIPAA really defers to state law in that respect. So any areas in New Mexico where a young person has the right to consent to health care, so reproductive health care, mental health care, um, and then care for uh, young people who are not living with a parent or guardian or who are parents, all of that care should be considered confidential under HIPAA because the state law allows the young person to consent to that. And there's a few other exceptions under HIPAA when care is confidential. So if a minor gets care, um, if the court in some situation ordered that the minor receive treatment, then that parent might not be able to access records. And if a parent says it's okay for the young person and the provider to have a confidential relationship. And so like I said earlier, New Mexico law allows a young person of any age to consent to reproductive health care. So this includes things like treatment and testing for sexually transmitted infections, pregnancy related services, and contraception. And I'll talk a little bit um, later about what when there needs to be a report of abuse and neglect because this is something that providers have a lot of questions about often and unfortunately is very complicated and I probably can't give people a straight answer but I can tell you what the law says um, and give you some guidance around how to approach that issue if there is a concern about abuse or neglect. Um, but really, if a young person comes in and needs any of these services related to reproductive health care, even if it's a very young person, um, you know, sometimes 11, 12, that young person is the one who has the right to consent to those services under New Mexico law. The, um, and so, the law doesn't say anything about whether or not the reproductive health care is confidential. It, the assumption is that because the law says a person of any age can consent to these reproductive health care services, this applies not only to the 13-year-old but to the 26-year-old. There's no differentiation in the law about what age a person is. So. Because of that, the interpretation is typically that if that all care is going to be confidential regardless of the person's age. 
Um, because the care would be confidential for the 26-year-old, it also should be confidential for the 12-year-old or the 13-year-old. The one exception is that the law says um, that a provider can release the results of testing for sexually transmitted diseases to the patient or the patient's legal guardian. And so it's not clear that whether or not the parents could access those results um, if they requested it. It doesn't say the provider has to give notice to the parents, but it says the provider may release to the parents if the parents request it. Um, so I think for, for providers, really, you need to have discussions with your agencies and ask how your agency wants to handle that situation should it come up. I don't think it comes up very often because typically if the young person is seeking care and is saying, I don't want to tell my parents, um, the parents probably aren't going to find out and aren't going to know to call and ask for the results of STI testing. But if they did call and ask, if they did find out somehow, their, the provider might feel that they had to disclose that information. So I think having really clear policies within your agencies about how to handle that and also um, making sure that the young person knows what the policy is within the agency so they're able to make a decision um, whether or not they want to have care um, or not. And just so they understand the risks of, you know, your parents could call and get the information if that is something um, that the agency feels that it needs to do or saying, actually, no, we're not going to release it. Um, but that's something that you, the providers are going to have to figure out individually. Um, and so, like I said, it doesn't, this law doesn't say anything about confidentiality for reproductive health care. And so this has been interpreted as giving the minor a right to confidentiality. OK. And so before I move on to mental health services, does anyone have any questions or thoughts about reproductive health care and how consent and confidentiality works for young people in that area? OK, great. Um, so the next big area where um, young people have rights to consent is around mental health services. And here there actually is an age. And so if a young person is under 14, the parents are the ones who have the right to consent to treatment. Um, except that a young person who is under 14 can consent to an ass initial assessment for medically necessary early intervention services that is limited to verbal therapy. So what this means is if a young person, a 13-year-old, is really in crisis and they feel that they can't talk to their parents about their mental health needs, they can go to a therapist and have an assessment um, that is limited to verbal therapy, but this gives the young person a way to go and talk to someone around, you know, whatever is going on, and then that provider can look at what services the young person might need and say, look, this is how I can help you either talk to your parents about this, or maybe, um, you know, once the young person has that initial assessment, they feel like actually they are okay and they don't need to continue services or if there really is a problem with the parent or guardian, the provider can look at whether or not there needs to be an abuse neglect report made. Um, and so let me go back here. The provider actually has two weeks to complete this initial assessment. Um, so the provider can see the child for up to two weeks before there would have to be consent from a parent or guardian to continue treatment. And there's no limitation on how often a child can go in for this early intervention um, assessment. So if a young person feels they are in crisis and they go in and they see a provider, they have the assessment, they feel like actually things are OK, and then a couple months later, this 13-year-old has another crisis, they can go back in for another assessment. Um, so they can always have that access initially 
And so the provider can help kind of problem solve and see what actually is going on and what type of follow-up services might be needed. Um, and so the, there's a question, is this time limitation, the two-week time limitation up to age 18? And no, this is only um, about that assessment for the young person who is under 14. Um, so thank you for that clarification, Louise. Um, and so if a young person is 14 or older, they have the right to consent to their own mental health treatment of any sort. So this means not only verbal therapy, um, but things like psychotropic medications, um, a placement in a residential treatment center or some type of out-of-home setting for um, other mental health treatments, so a treatment foster care placement, um, any type of mental health services. If the young person is 14 or older, they are the ones who have the right to consent. Um, the parents get notice if a young person 14 or older is prescribed psychotropic medications, but they don't get to veto um, that young person's consent. So if a 15-year-old is prescribed um, Prozac, then the parents would have to get, the provider has to give the parents notice. But um, the parents can't come back and say, no, my 15-year-old can't take this medication. The 15-year-old is the one who gets to make that decision. Um, practically, this can be difficult if the 15-year-old is living with the parent um, and the parent is, you know, is insuring the 15-year-old and the parent is not willing to take the 15-year-old to the pharmacy to get that prescription filled. So I think not only looking at, yes, you have the right to do this with the young people we're working with, but practically, how are you going to make that possible if you're in a situation where you feel that your parents are not supportive of this treatment? Um, and so I think it really is on the providers to talk to the young person and try and engage the parents as well um, to see, you know, this is really why this is, treatment is important for this young person and um, help try and help the parents um, and the young person work on that relationship as well as possible. And so if there's a concern that a child who is 14 or older lacks capacity to make decisions um, about mental health treatment, then there's a process for a parent to act as the surrogate without a court order. So what that requires is that two clinicians, so one has to be an independent clinician. It can't be the treating clinician. Um, so two clinicians have to make the determination that the young person doesn't have capacity. Um, and then the parent can step into the decision-making role unless the young person can, objects. And so if a young person objects to the parent making the decision, then um, there would have to be a court order. And so just to, and the other thing I want to emphasize is that I think very often we look at young people and we want to be protective, and rightly so, but there's a concern that a young person is not able to make good decisions. And a young person is saying, well, actually, I know I've been prescribed these medications, but I don't think I want to take them. And I think very often people then look at that and say, well, the young person doesn't have capacity because they don't want to take these medications or they don't want to go to treatment foster care, residential treatment, or whatever the case may be. And um, actually, the law is really clear that just because a child is objecting or not consent to a certain treatment is not evidence that the child lacks capacity. And um, I think actually when a young person is saying, no, I don't want to have this treatment, talking with them about why they don't want to is really important. And very often my experience is that actually young people have good reasons to not want to engage in certain treatments very often. Um, and so having that conversation is really important to try and figure out what is going to actually work for this young person. Okay, and then with mental health treatment, confidentiality basically follows the consent rights. 
So if a young person is under 14, the legal custodian is the one who gets to consent to disclosure of information. Um, if the child is over 14, then they are the ones who have the right to say yes or no to disclosing mental health records. Um, the exception to this, like I said before, is that parents will get notice if a young person is prescribed psychotropic medications. Um, and then, um, so b before I move on, is there are there questions or thoughts about the mental health care piece of this um, and how consent and confidentiality works for mental health care treatment? Okay, great. Um, so then I'm going to move on to the next big area where young people have rights to consent to health care. And this is um, for young people who are 14 or older. Um, and if they are living apart from their parents or they are the parent of a child themselves. So a 15 year old who is um, not living with a parent or guardian, she may have run away from home. Um, her parents may have just up and left. I see that a lot um, where parents have mental health or substance abuse issues. Um, if that young person is not living with a parent or guardian, um, and they're 14 years or older, they have the ability to consent to medically necessary health care for themselves. Um, if a young person is 14 or older and they are the parent of a child, they also um, have the right to consent to their own medically necessary health care. And so this law really was designed to address two different problems. So one, the first area with a young person who is not living with a parent or guardian, before this law was passed in 2009, they really had no way to access health care on their own um, without having a parent or guardian to consent for them. And so there were young people who were not living with the parent or guardian um, who you know, couldn't go to the doctor and get antibiotics if they had a sinus infection. Um, so really basic care and the, you know, they would go to the emergency room. I had clients who would go to the emergency room. They would be told, well, we can't do anything for you because you, it's not a life threatening emergency and there's no parent or guardian who is able to sign for you. Um, and so they really were not able to access care. And the other area where um, there were kind of a, a disconnect in the law is with the young person who was the parent of a child. So you would have a 15 year old parent who could consent to brain surgery for her infant child, but couldn't consent to her own antibiotic treatment. And really that made no sense. Um, so the thinking was if we're saying this young person can consent to their child's care, probably they have the ability to consent to their own care as well. And you know, there is a line with the 14 years of age. And so it's possible that there, I mean, there are certainly situations where 13 year olds, 12 year olds are not living with the parent and they unfortunately are not able to access care. Um, the same with, you know, a parent who is under 14. You know, if there's a 13 year old and they have a child um, absent any unfitness on their part, that 13 year old is the one who has the right to make decisions about her child or his child, um, but they wouldn't be able to access their own um, medical care and consent to their own medical care. And um, one thing that's come up a lot, and I'm interested in hearing from you all about whether or not this is an issue for you, but I have had a lot of providers question what does medically necessary care mean? what can a young person consent to in this situation? And so I didn't actually include the definition on the slides because it is kind of long, um, but the, if you look up the statute, it, the definition is in the statute and that's the statutory site there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But medically necessary healthcare means, um, and this is a long definition, but I, it's very broad, clinical and rehabilitative, physical, mental, or behavioral health services 
that are essential to prevent, diagnose, or treat medical conditions, or that are essential to enable an unemancipated minor to attain, maintain, or regain functional capacity, delivered in the amount and setting with the duration and scope that is clinically appropriate to the specific physical, mental, and behavioral health needs of the minor, provided with professionally accepted standards of practice and national guidelines, and required to meet the physical, mental, and behavioral health needs of the minor, uh, but not primarily required for the convenience of the minor healthcare provider or payer. And so this is a very broad definition, and it can encompass a lot of things. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it is going to be up to the individual providers and their agencies to figure out what they think is in the medically necessary, um, what falls under that purview, um, and that really is your all area of expertise. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical provider. So I can't say, you know, yes, this is going to be, you know, within the professionally accepted standards of practice and essential to prevent, diagnose, or treat, whatever. But I do want to stress that this is a very broad definition, and the intent was to make sure that young people really were able to access care if they needed to. Um, and one area that actually has come up quite a bit for me is with dental care um, because a lot of young people need to go to the dentist um, and are not able to do so or told they're not able to do so. And um, I think a lot of dentists just aren't aware that this is the law. So if when I have talked to dentist's office and explained the law and explained the situation, that that young person is in, they are usually willing to treat the young person and see dental care as falling under that purview. So I think um, thinking about this really broadly is important to make sure that young people are able to get care if they're not living with the parent or guardian. Um, and so, what are the what are the consequences to a medical provider? Okay, so good question. So the question is, <laughs> what are the consequences to a medical provider? Um, so what the law says um, is that the healthcare provider is not going to be liable um, for reasonably relying on what the young person says when they come in. Um, and so if a young person comes in and they say, you know, I'm 16, my parents threw me out, I need to, you know, see a doctor because I'm having really bad stomach pains, and the provider says, well, you know, it seems reasonable. We don't have any reason to think you're not telling the truth about this. Um, then, And they treat the young person, and later the parents come back and say, well, you had no right to do that. This 15-year-old was living with me. Um, the provider is not going to be liable if they think the young person is telling a reasonable story and they have no reason to think differently. And again, this is something that I think you all will have to figure out within your agencies how you want to handle these things. Um, but having that conversation is really important. And actually, having policies about this is really important, too, because I think a lot of healthcare providers haven't really thought about it. It's a relatively new law. Um, and it's not, it's not something that comes up very often. So a, a lot of providers just don't encounter it and haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. So being able to have policies about that is would be very helpful, I think. Okay. And so this, oh, sorry. Um, so there's a question, what about financial responsibility? Um, if the child has Medicaid, I would expect it to be covered, but what about co-pays or self-pay? And so that is a good question, and that is a question that is, unfortunately, does not have a clear answer. Um, so if there is Medicaid, um, then probably the care would be covered. If the ch child has um, independent insurance, um, either through a parent or some other way, then that young person is going to probably be responsible for the copay unless the provider is willing to waive it. Um, and the, if there's some kind of coinsurance or the deductible hasn't been met or however that an insurance plan is set up, again, there, I mean, that is going to be really up to the provider to talk with that 
talk with that young person about that. Um, and so good, Luis is already um, knows what I get to next. Um, so she said the bill will come to the house. How does that intersect with confidentiality? So that's also something that the young person needs to be aware of. Is that this is your parents' insurance? They're going to have to pay, you know, X amount for this treatment, and the insurance, or you know, the insurance isn't going to cover that, and so that bill is going to have to come to your parents' house unless you, um, you know, 15-year-old um, can pay that. And so there actually is a coalition working on that issue um, around how to address some of those problems because it is very complicated and it is um, it is a real problem for young people. Um, and so Nancy Rodriguez um, with the Alliance on School-Based Health is the one who is working on that. And um, so probably McCain, can you, if people are interested in joining that coalition, um, just let us know in in the chat box and um, we can get you hooked up with that group as well. I, I have another question that's somewhat related and has come up and I think it's more kind of to what people have done but um, if, the, if you work in a clinic where there's a sliding scale, um, how would you address or have, do you have thoughts about how to address the care for that individual? Um, if it's based on the a sliding scale, is it based on their income? And if they are in school, do they have no in have no income, mm -hmm. um, or would it be based on their parental income? And I don't know, just kind of an issue that's come up, and I don't know if anybody right. has any thoughts about that. Okay, so that is an issue that I also see up quite a bit in terms of when the clinic is trying to figure out whose income they're using. Um, if it is a young person who's not living with parent or guardian, um, what I've talked with clinics about and what has, I mean, they've seen it as reasonable is that you, we're just going to look at this young person as an individual. They're not with the parent or guardian. They often don't even have any knowledge of what their parents said might be and they have no way to access that information. Um, if a young person is going in to get care for themselves because they're the parent of a child, that's often a different situation. Um, and a lot of times young parents are living with their own parents if they're under 18 or even if they're 18 or older. And so the clinic then I think is going to have to figure out how do we, should we count just for the income of that young person and their child? Um, should we be looking at parents? Should we be looking at other people in the household? And there's not a clear answer on that and different clinics have done it differently um, based on my experience. And so, with young people who are not living with the parent or guardian or young people who are parents, the statute, the law doesn't say anything about confidentiality. So it really is up to the provider to use their judgment. Um, the provider can rely on HIPAA and say if um, the young person has the right to consent under the state law, HIPAA says that information is confidential as to the young person. So the young person is the one who has the right to release that information or not release it. Um, I think the billing and the insurance questions are very complicated. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Louise, because it even if the provider is saying, I'm not going to tell your parents, I'm not going to give this information to your parents, um, the billing department may not be able to do that. Um, and so it is very complicated, and the parents may get insurance communications as well if there's private insurance. Okay. And so now I'm going to move on. Um, and so kind of moving away from the healthcare specific to the um, rights of young parents more broadly. And so my, I've worked 
worked with young parents, um, you know, about seven years now. And my experience is that really, with the appropriate support, um, they are very capable and incredible caregivers. And they face incredible stigma in society. And because of that stigma, they often are afraid to seek out health care. Um, they are often denied access to education. Um, they have trouble getting housing if they're under 18. And so they face really significant barriers on top of the already difficult job of being a parent, which is difficult no matter how old you are. And so being able to support young parents um, and making sure that when they are seeking health care, they not only have access to care, but they have supportive providers who can really help them find other resources if they need housing resources, if they need legal resources, um, thinking about those kinds of things as really holistic support for young parents um, to help them be successful. And so parents have a constitutional right to care for and raise their children. And this is all parents, regardless of age. This is the US Constitution, as it's been interpreted by the Supreme Court, says that um, all parents, regardless of their age, have the right to raise their children um, unless they are unfit, unless they've abused or neglected their children. Um, and so this becomes difficult, though, because typically there are two people who have legal rights to a child. There are two parents. And um, how that those rights get split up and shared between the parents is very complicated. Um, and so there's two types of custody, and this is very confusing for a lot of young people and adults, too. Um, so there's legal custody, which is who gets to make decisions about the child, who decides where the child lives, who decides when the child, um, if the child needs major surgery, who gets to make that decision. What if one parent says, I want the child to have the surgery, and the other parent says, no, I don't think so. How does that get resolved? And physical custody is who lives with the child. Who does the child spend most of their time with? So these are really two separate concepts. Um, and the law treats them separately. Um, and so with legal custody, the presumption in New Mexico is that um, both that there will be joint legal custody, which means both parents have the right to make major decisions about the child's life. So they have to communicate and agree on these decisions. And this is things like um, the child's residence, so the city and state where the child lives, um, what school the child goes to, who the doctors are, who's going to do child care, what the child's religion will be. And this is the default in New Mexico. And courts really want to see that parents are working together and trying to have discussions and come to agreements about what is going to be best for their child in terms of these major life decisions. So sole legal custody is when all decisions are made by one parent. And that's usually only when there's really extreme circumstances. So when there's been violence by one parent toward the other, um, when one parent is out of state or incarcerated, or when there's so much conflict between the parents that they are not able to communicate. Um, so like I said, New Mexico law wants, um, you know, assumes that joint legal custody is going to be in the child's best interest absent some really extraordinary circumstances. And I think this is really hard sometimes for young people um, because they are, they find it, they, are, they typically are not in a relationship with another parent when they're at the point when they're looking at custody. And they are, you know, they're trying to manage the emotions of, um, you know, why do I want to talk to this person? He went off and left me, and he doesn't want to be with me anymore. 
and balance that with, um, you know, how can we work together to make sure that our child um, has a good experience even though we're not in a relationship. And that's hard for anyone, I mean, no matter what their age is, but it's particularly hard for young people, particularly when they are really in a stressful situation, um, trying to figure out how to care for an infant, usually um, trying to figure out housing, they may be having conflicts with their own parents or other relatives. Um, so really, um, there's a lot of counseling that goes on in talking to young people about custody arrangements and helping them be able to manage their emotions so that they can look at what's going to be best for their child and not be um, not get caught up in whatever is going on in the relationship with the other parent. Um, and so physical custody, like I said, is who the child lives with. And typically when there's a very young child, um, what is going to be best in terms of that child's development is that they have one consistent caregiver that they live with the majority of the time. And that the other parent would have, you know, really short, frequent contact with the child. Um, so, you know, maybe two hours every day a week. Um, and so, Typically, both parents are going to be able to have some period of time with the child. Even if the other parent um, has been really violent or there are concerns about a parent, that, the, that parent still does have rights to have at least some contact with the child, um, even if it has to be supervised. So I have had a lot of young people who've said, well, I don't you know, I don't want this other parent to ever see the child, and that's not realistic. Um, and actually, probably in the long run, is not going to be best for the child either. And the other thing that's difficult is talking with young people about child development considerations. So I have a lot of young parents who say, well, I talked to the mom or I talked to the dad, and we came up with this agreement where this two-week-old is going to spend one week with dad and one week with me and um, talking to them about why that may not really be the best thing for a two-week-old infant. Um, so making sure they understand how that the custody arrangement actually is going to impact their child's development is really important as well. Um, and so the next big topic that comes up quite a bit is paternity. And basically, how someone becomes the child's legal father if they are not married to the mother. And so if the parents are not married and the father hasn't signed what's called an acknowledgement of paternity, then that father is not considered the legal father. And so um, a lot of times, what, what, how it comes up is the father's name is not on the birth certificate. So in order to get on the birth certificate, there mu that acknowledgement of paternity has to be signed. And both parents have to sign it. So I've had some situations where um, the father will go to the hospital, he'll be there when the baby's born, and for whatever reason, the mother doesn't want him to be on the birth certificate, and so he will sign the acknowledgement of paternity, but the mother refuses to sign it. Um, I've had situations where the father is, you know, not present at the hospital when the child's born for whatever reason. Um, so the mother is, says, well, he's dad, I want to put him on the birth certificate, but if he is not signed that acknowledgement of paternity, his name can't go on the birth certificate. Um, and the parents have um, a year after the child is born to sign that acknowledgement of paternity. So it doesn't have to happen at the hospital at that moment when the child is born. Um, but if there isn't an acknowledgement of paternity signed by both parents for whatever reason, then paternity has to be established by the court. Um, and another thing that actually I see come up quite a bit um, is that a uh, the mother will be in a relationship with someone who is not the father, um, and that person is the one who goes with the mother to the hospital when the child's born, and um, says, "Well, I, you know, I'm in a relationship with this person now. I, 
you know, I told her I'd be there for her and the child. I'm going to sign this and put my name on the birth certificate as the dad. And um, that is possibly, probably not the best idea. Um, because once that person signs the acknowledgement of paternity, um, he is on the hook as the legal father for the next 18 years. And he will really be considered um, the the father for that time period until the child is 18. So making sure that young people are thinking very carefully about that and understand that. Um, and so Louise has a question, how do you start the process to establish paternity by the court? Um, and so that is actually my next slide. Um, so what you would need to do is that young person has to file a petition to establish paternity. And most courts, district courts, have um, paternity packets. So this is a packet of forms that the person can go and file to start a paternity and custody case. Um, and so often, if there's a dispute about paternity, the court will order genetic testing. Um, but you don't need genetic testing always to find that the um, person is the legal father. And so um, once that petition is filed with the court, then the other parent would get a copy of it. They have the right to say, I don't think I'm the legal parent, or you know, I don't think I'm the father. If it's the mother filing the petition, um, the mother can say, I don't think this person is the father. Um, and then there, you know, there is a court hearing. And um, like I said, if there's dispute, usually there's genetic testing. Um, and if not, then the court can make an order saying this person is the legal father. Um, and this person, um, this person can put their name on the birth certificate. Um, and so there's a question. If there's no dispute, then they can just fill out the forms and file. And so if they're in that one year time limit, um, they can just, they don't even have to go to court. They can just sign the acknowledgement of paternity and send that to Vital Records. And that will get the father's name on the birth certificate. Um, and there won't, they don't even need to go through a court process to establish paternity. Um, if they are over, yes. And if they're over the one year limit, then they can just fill out the forms and say, you know, we We've agreed this person is the father. I you know, believe I'm the father and just fill out the forms and file it with the court. Um, and then the court will issue an order establishing paternity. And so the next area that comes up a lot for young parents. Um, OK, um, so sorry. So going back to paternity, um, so is there a fee? And so there is a fee to file a court case. There's a $137, um, what's called um, opening fee to start a court case. If the young person does not have the financial ability to pay for that, they can get the um, that fee waived. And so there's a process called um, an application for free process. And there is a form for that at all the district courts. Um, and so they can fill that out and get that filing fee waived. Um, some courts do charge a fee. Um, here in Bernalillo County, it's $10 to actually purchase the packet with the forms. So there may be a smaller charge, um, depending on the court, for um, getting the actual the packet with the forms. And so the next, um, OK, so there's one more question, probably not one more. But um, another question about paternity. Does the mother have to notify the genetic father before her new partner, who was not the genetic father, signs the AOP? So no, she doesn't. So I've had cases, actually, where um, I've represented young fathers who have said, you know, this other person is on the birth certificate. but um, the, the, I, I'm positive I, this child is mine. I really would like to establish myself as the father. 
Um, and so we've had to go to court, and there is a process to actually um, disestablish someone as the father and establish someone else as the legal father. So that that does come up also. And so with child support, all parents, regardless of their age, have an obligation to support their child. Um, and so this means that even if a person is 14 um, and they have a child, they have an obligation to support that child. And this is really difficult um, for young people who are still in high school, who are trying to continue their education um, and move forward so they can actually provide good support to their children um, you know when they are older and better able to have the higher paying job really um, so I think people if we are working with young parents we really should be advocating for them to be able to not have to pay support so they continue, can continue their education. And this is really difficult because someone has to financially care for this child. Um, and very often when the parents are young, they don't have the resources to do it. And so if the child is living primarily with the mother, um, that burden falls really on the mother's family. And it's very difficult. Um, when there's not any assistance from the father. Um, so it can, it can lead to really difficult situations for young people. But honestly, if the young father is going to be able to actually finish school and you know attend college and be able to get a higher paying job in the future, he is going to be in a much better position to help the mother and the child going forward. And so the other thing I think to make people aware of is that if one parent is getting TANF benefits for the child, um, the state might attempt to collect support from the non-custodial parent. So if a 15-year-old mother is getting TANF benefits, the state may file an action against the 15-year-old father to collect support. So that's something um, that I think we just need to make young people aware of. Um, and so Louise said the same with child care subsidy, correct? And I actually don't think that's correct. I know there was a lot of discussion in the news recently about um, the state going after parents um, when a, one parent was getting a child care subsidy. But that subsidy is set up through CYFD. It's separate from the TANF program. And the TANF program has federal requirements um, around getting support from non-custodial parents. The child care subsidy regulations don't actually have those same requirements. Um, so if someone is um, being told that they have to give the father's name or if they are being told that the father or the mother, depending on whoever it is who has custody of the child, that the non-custodial parent is going to be, someone is going to go after him for child support because the parent is getting a child care subsidy, I would um, really question that because I don't think that's correct and I don't think there's anything in the child care regulations that say the state is going to recoup from a non-custodial parent for that subsidy. Um, and so uh, we are almost out of time, but I really want to um, look at abuse, neglect, and reporting requirements. Um, and so being young is not in and of itself unfit. So if a parent is 13, that alone is not grounds for someone to come in and say, you can't care for your child, you can't make decisions. Um, so when, well, maybe I don't have it in here. So when a provider or anyone has um, 
a reasonable suspicion that a child is being abused or neglected. So this may be the 13-year-old parent or it may be the 13-year-old parent's infant. That provider and that whoever it is has a duty to re make a report to CYFD about that um, suspected abuse or neglect. And so this is also something that we need to talk with young people about, particularly young parents, um, that if, if there is a concern that they're not able to care for their child, um, you want to help them um, figure out how to better support them and what, you know, figure out how we can find resources to help them. But if there really is a concern for that um, child, that um, young parent's child's immediate safety, the provider may have to report that. And the same goes for the young parent. Um, if the parent is under 18 and there is a concern that they are being abused and neglected, um, then the provider also does have an obligation to report that as well. And this comes up really with very young parents. Um, you know, I've had some clients who are, you know, 12 year old parents. And when a young person is that young and is coming in either pregnant or with a child, very often um, there is concern on the part of providers and there may be some type of need to report. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I know this was a lot of information and um, I've crammed into a very short time, but thank you very much for participating today. Here's my contact information. Um, please feel free to contact me if you have questions or if you have young parents um, who are able to, you know, who needs legal support. Um, Pegasus is happy to talk to them. We represent young parents who are 19 and under in court and we are able to give advice um, over the phone to young parents who are 20 to 23. Um, and we, I, like I said before, I do a lot of work with young people who are not living with the parent or guardian. Um, so those young people are always free to contact me as well um, to talk about their situation if they need assistance. And, and I know we're out of time, but I have one question that has come up that if you know folks are able to stay on, I'm hoping Grace can just address. Um, the issue of expectant teens has come up um, and whether uh, they can consent to their care. Um, and I just was wondering if you could address that. Sure. And this is actually um, not clear. Um, <laughs> so what the law says about um, um, young people who are 14 and older being able to consent to their own medically necessary care is that that person can consent if they are the parent of a child. So it really is going to be up to interpretation um, as to, you know, if a young person who's 14 comes in and she's pregnant and she says, I need, um, I think I have an ear infection, um, it is going to be up to the provider and how they interpret that parent of a child um, language as to whether or not they think she can consent to that. And it is difficult because we want young people to be able to access care and to access care broadly, um, but there are ramifications to defining the parenthood as starting at, you know, conception or initial pregnancy. So it it is not clear, and it is unfortunately very difficult. And how about prenatal care? Is and that so that it, a young person can consent to prenatal care no matter what their age. Um, so if there's any kind of pregnancy related care or um, a reproductive health care, if the young person decides they want to terminate that pregnancy, they can always consent to that no matter what their age is. Um, and so if the provider can somehow tie this other medically necessary care to prenatal care, then the young person probably can consent and you don't have to get into that muddy issue of are they the parent or are they not a parent. If the, it can be somehow tied to other prenatal care that that young person is getting because if a young person comes in and they're pregnant, even if they're coming in for, um, you know, because they think they have an ear infection or whatever, um, probably the provider is going to say, to at least ask questions about the pregnancy and what kind of a support they might need around that. 
And does that is that because that falls under reproductive health care? Or is there a specific statute about so, prenatal um, so care? So there is a specific statute, um, let me go back, about pregnancy-related care. And so it's I listed them. Our statutes about um, reproductive health care are not, they're kind of scattered and old, and no one has looked at them for a long time. Um, but there's three separate, um, whoops, there we go. Three separate oh, yeah. places where it talks about um, reproductive health care in the law. So the first is around treatment for sexually transmitted infections. Then there's another section of the law about pregnancy-related services. And then there's another section about contraception. Okay. Um, and so there is the statutory citations um, for those three separate areas of the law. Um, and so... But a final comment from Nancy, um, DOH says that school-based health centers don't do prenatal care. It does complicate matters for school-based health centers, and that is. But I guess if they, if they were saying they're doing pregnancy-related services and didn't call it prenatal services, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's right. an ongoing question. Right. All right, any lingering questions? I know we're over time, but if we have Grace here, so if anybody has any other questions before we sign off, this is your chance. Okay. All right, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Grace.